to proceed. This is uh, another session on Tariq al Tashriya or the history of legislation. And uh, we started by introduction. If you remember, we talked about fiqh and we talked about the definition of fiqh, uh, linguistic definition, technical definition, definition according to the earlier scholars, according to the latter scholars. We talked about the difference between fiqh and uh, sharia. And uh, we discussed this in, in some extensive detail. Uh, and then we talked about the difference between Sharia and the, the man-made laws. And we talked about how Sharia is comprehensive and it includes all of the man-made laws. And we were able to identify where something like labor laws belongs in the books of fiqh. Some of the maritime laws belong in the books of fiqh, constitutional, uh, basically, uh, the, you know, public and private laws. and and the difference between the public laws and the private laws and international law and where that belongs in the books of fiqh and so on and so forth. And then <coughs> the second unit we started to talk about at al-fiqh during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is basically the fiqh during the, first, uh, genera during the time of the first uh, Muslim generation. And uh, we addressed, uh, you know, the sources of Sharia. We talked about the sources of Sharia, and we talk, then talked about the Quran, and we defined the Quran, and we talked about the issue of tadarruj or the issue of graduation uh, or gradual legislation, which is tadarruj in Sharia, which is one of the genius aspects of Sharia uh, that uh, it used tadarruj or graduation in legislating laws so that it could actually address a, a, a completely lawless generation with, uh, and make them a very regulated uh, generation. Uh, so when you come in uh, and, and try to impose laws that would make it a very, very regulated uh, law uh, abiding uh, generation, uh, when this is introduced to a generation that was completely lawless, such as the such as the Arabs of Arabia, uh, then that is that requires a graduation. That for sure does require graduation. So uh, last time we were talking about graduation when it comes to the graduation of the different tashriyas. So not everything was, was uh, you know, it was uh, revealed at the same time. Uh, but for instance, uh, Salah was revealed in the night of Al-Isra, and that is in the Meccan period. That's the only thing, the major uh, legislation that was revealed in the Meccan period. And even if the zakah was prescribed in the Meccan period, is when it, was not, it was not the zakah that we know now that has those uh, percentages and so on and so forth. But Salah was the only major legislation that was prescribed in the Meccan period, which also points out the importance of the Salah to the integrity of your deen, because in the Meccan period, uh, only the foundations of the deen were addressed, the Aqidah, and so on and so forth. So the, the Salah was legislated in the Meccan period, and that really, really underscores the importance of Salah to the integrity of uh, your deen. So it, uh, some, uh, the scholars who consider uh, the, the abandonment of Salah, whether it is out of laziness or out of rejection, to be an act of disbelief. Although they are the minority of the scholars and the majority considers this to be an act of disbelief if it is only out of rejection, but they will have a say. They, will, they, they, they have an argument. They have some good argument to make on behalf of their position that uh, abandonment of Salah out of laziness is also an act of total disbelief. Uh, so the, on the night of the Isra, the night journey uh, which occurred one year before the Hijra, the Salah uh, was prescribed uh, during the first year after the Hijra. And we went over this the, the last time, but just a uh, refresher. Uh, first year after Hijra, the Azan called to the prayer and fighting the disbelievers were, were, were legislated. Likewise, some marriage related judgments uh, were legislated, such as Sadaq, Dawri, and Walima uh, marriage. Um, you see, you know, that also tells you of the importance of the, the regulation of marriage. And marriage, as we said before, 
is somewhere between the area of fiqh al-ibadat and fiqh al-mu'amalat, between the fiqh of worship and fiqh of transactions. And you find it heavily regulated, much more regulated than the fiqh of transactions, but less regulated than the fiqh of worship. Less regulated than the fiqh of worship where every movement in the prayer, you have a hadith describing every movement of your finger, of your feet, of this or that. Marriage is somewhere in the middle because although it is a transaction between two people, it does have some uh, devotional connotations. You're building a family uh, for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it also points out the, the, the consistency of, of this relationship, permanency of their teachings regarding marriage. They don't need to be uh, tweaked. They don't need to be changed. They don't, there is no need for much flexibility when it comes to that relationship like the case in financial transactions where we were given guidelines so that we will have enough room for flexibility. Uh, so it was regulated heavily by the hadith. It was legislated early during the uh, uh, Medinan time. It points out the importance of uh, observing the laws of the family laws in general uh, in Islam. During the second year after Hijrah, Saum fasting, the prayer of uh, two Aids, uh, the sacrificing of animals, Uthaya, and Zakah were legislated. All this was legislated in the second year after Hijrah. The Qibla was changed also in the second year after Hijrah. In the third year after Hijrah, the rulings on inheritance, divorce, and shortening of the prayer in times of travel and fear were legislated, and that gives you basically a rough idea of the timeline of legislation during the time of the Prophet ﷺ. During the fourth year after Hijrah, the punishment for zina was instituted. Allah sent down the rulings on tayammum, uh, dry ablution, uh, and uh, Allah prescribed hajj, although this is a controversial issue. Whether Allah prescribed hajj in the fourth year or not is a prescribed, uh, is a controversial issue. Some of the scholars said it's the eighth uh, year. Because if you say that Allah prescribed the Hajj in the fourth year, uh, then, then Hajj will be ala tarahi, not immediately obligatory. Uh, so during the sixth year after Hijrah, and he jumped over the fifth year after Hijrah, but something big was legislated in the fifth year after Hijrah, which is Hijab. Hijab uh, was legislated in the fifth year after Hijrah. So that's a big thing. Uh, he, he skipped over this and he went to the sixth year after Hijrah. Allah revealed the rulings on uh, sulh reconciliation and ihsar inability to reach the sacred house as well as the drinking of khamr, gambling and ansab uh, altars established for idols and aslam, the, div the divining by arrows, were all prohibited. During the seventh year after Hijrah, the meat of uh, domesticated donkeys was prohibited while the judgment of... Um, Muzara, share cropping, and Musaqa, share tenancy, uh, were legislated. Uh, musaqa is basically, literally means watering. And the difference between Muzara and Musaqa is share cropping, you know, pertains to crops where, where watering or share tenancy belongs to trees, orchards. So Musaqa is Muzara when it comes to orchards. Muzara is Musaqa when it comes to crops. Because in, in orchards, the, the owner does not only own the land, but he also owns the trees. So the worker would be working on the trees, basically. So the main function of the worker here would be watering. So it was called watering and not muzara because he's not really planting anything. He's not really planting the crops, sowing the seeds. He's just watering the trees. That's his main function. During the seventh year after Hijrah, okay, we would, uh, in the eighth year after Hijrah, the punishment of theft was enacted. In the ninth year after Hijrah, the case of Li'an, mutual imprecation, was instituted and the disbelievers were prevented from entering Mecca. In the tenth year after Hijrah, usury was clearly prohibited. And that, you know, how do we benefit from this? It, it, it does not mean that we will go back and, you know, engage in usury, uh, but it means that you. Um, you basically uh, have to understand that usury requires a foundation and a, a society that is conducive 
to the Islamic rulings uh, concerning uh, financial transactions uh, and without a, an Islamic system, an economic Islamic system, it will be rather extremely difficult to avoid usury altogether, altogether, to be completely cl clear of usury uh, in, a, in a society that is not conducive will be extremely difficult. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu said that there will come a time where all of you will consume you, uh, our usury, all of you will consume riba, and the Prophet was asked, all of us will consume it? He said, those who will not consume it will breathe it because it will be in the air. And this is the time where usury is actually in the air. <laughs> yeah, it is. So skipping over the, the, what we had already gone over before, this was a timeline of the legislations in Medina. So this is basically when it comes to graduation as far as the different legislations. Not all of them were prescribed together, but rather in phases. And you know, the ones that were prescribed earlier, it shows you their importance, it shows you particularly with the Salah prescribed in the Meccan period, not even waiting for, for them to reach in Medina. And that shows you how you know, essential it is to the integrity of one's faith. Uh, and the last thing being legislated is riba which tells you of the difficulty, uh, you know, which does not mean that we should be uh, negligent. It, it just means that we should work at collectively uh, to be saved uh, from riba because individually it will be hard. Individually it will be hard. Collectively we could do it because it requires an infrastructure. It requires like companies and, and so on and so forth, infrastructure to, to save us from uh, riba. And it's, so that's why it was not prohibited until the 10th year after Hijra when the Muslims had the infrastructure, had the state that, that would uh, impose uh, laws that are not ribawir laws. Now the gradual prohibition, and we talked about the uh, phases uh, the, of legislation when it comes to the particular acts of worship. We talked about how Salah was, was not as we uh, practice it now, uh, how they used to be able to talk in Salah, how they used to be able to answer one another in Salah, uh, and do things of that nature in Salah, and how that was later uh, prohibited. And we talked about uh, Siyam, and how Siyam was actually lightened, because it was harder in the beginning, because you need to do this, particularly with something like Siyam, you need to make it hard, harder in the beginning, and then lighten it up, uh, so for Siyam, you know, if they slept after Maghrib and they woke up, they couldn't eat, you know, uh, they couldn't uh, participate in, they, they could not have mutual relations with their wives and so on and so forth. So Allah permitted the mutual relations at night, Allah allowed them to eat even if they slept after Maghrib and woke up. Uh, so it was made uh, lighter. So not everything was made stricter over time, but some things were legislated harder uh, earlier on, and then they were lightened up later on. So that is a tadarruj or graduation concerning one tashriya or concerning uh, one uh, law or legislation. Now, today we are at the point uh, of discussing the gradual prohibition of khamr. And uh, so the Sheikh here says that the Arabs were very fond of drinking khamr. Uh, they used to, to pride themselves in drinking uh, khamr and serving it to their guests. So basically, uh, So we, we drink it and then it makes us muluk, you know, kings and, and ust means lions, uh, brave gives it, make, and khamr does uh, make you to some extent uh, have like delusions of grandiosity and act like you are, you know, a lion or, uh, so it does do that to some extent. Uh, that we are not shaken or deterred or we are not shaken by the confrontation, by confrontation, uh, confrontation of the enemy. And you find people who are drunk, they are not really afraid of confrontation. And that's where they get in trouble. 
but uh, so what the Sheikh is trying to say here is that uh, this is a little bit of a different uh, issue here. It's 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 a different, it's a totally different game here because you you're not really addressing people who recognize the evil of khamr, but you want to tell them you know stop drinking khamr, and you want to give them some tips. To, to be able to wean themselves off of Khamr. You're talking to a people who consider this razila or this graceful act a fadila, a virtuous act. So uh, that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started from the very bottom uh, and, he, uh, and, and, and like I said, some of the things that are addictive, you need, to, you need more graduation with regard to things that are addictive than you need graduation with regard to things that are not uh, addictive. So you, you, you prohibit div divining by arrows. You prohibit using the altars uh, for uh, the or the slaughtering of animals. So you, you prohibit these things uh, like uh, spontaneously, uh, one time, you know, with one command and people w would, would desist. Because this is really not addictive. Uh, it's something that you need to recognize that it's evil. You need to stop it, stop it, that's it. But when it comes to something like khamr, uh, out of recognition of the, the addictive nature of khamr, and out of recognition also that this is so, uh, like, so ingrained into the minds and practices of the people of Arabia of the time where they consider this to be a fadila, it is a good thing to drink. It is a virtuous thing to drink because it makes you brave, it makes you courageous, and so on. So the, 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 the tashriya started from a, basically a simple hint to the uh, prohibition of khamr. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was counting his bounties on them, he said that of the bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, and from the fruits of the palm trees and uh, grapevines, you take intoxicant and good provision. You take intoxicant, uh, and you know the issue of whether sakar is intoxicant or not, we will use the word intoxicant for lack of a better word, but sakar is not intoxication. Uh, intoxication is one thing, and because intoxication would include by, you know, uh, basically, linguistically would, would include mukhaddarat uh, or uh, drugs, uh, linguistically. But, but sakar does not necessarily include mukhaddarat, and that's a whole fiqhi uh, disagreement. So the, the, the problem with translation is sometimes it, it, it ends the fiqhi disagreement. We will, because if, if we say this is intoxicant, you know, intoxicant was prohibited in the Quran, then drugs will be prohibited uh, by the statement, by the nas, by the text of the Quran, and that ends the fiqhi disagreement when it, wa it, it is already starting. It's only starting. So sakar, in other words, is the condition that, uh, you know, the condition that you go through after you drink wine. <laughs> and if you find like a good uh, word for this, then you, uh, then share it. Uh, the, because the condition that happens after drinking wine may not be the same uh, like the uh, smoking marijuana, for instance. Now the scholars will prohibit marijuana by agreement because it changes your mind, impairs your judgment, things of that nature. But the scholars do not agree on considering marijuana a khamr. Or, you know, much, there is much controversy over this issue. Uh, anyway, so that's just branching off here. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says تَتَّخِذُونَ مِنْهُ سَكَرًا وَرِزْقًا حَسَنًا that you take, uh, that you take intoxicant and good provision out of thereof, uh, then Allah is hinting that the sakar is not good provision. Right? So that is the first hint. And then the s second one was, Ya uh, amanu la taqrabu salata wa antum sukara. Oh, you who believe, do not, 
approach the prayer while you are intoxicated. Do not approach the prayer. Where is this? Anyway, it will be somewhere here. Okay, oh, you believe do not approach the prayer while you are intoxicated until you know what you're saying. No, I, okay, so the, there is the, 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 the uh, before this, يسألونك عن الخمر يا الميسر كل فيهما إثم كبير ومنافع على الناس وإثمهما أكبر من نفعهما. They ask you about uh, wine and gambling. Say in them there is great sin and benefit for people, but their sin is greater than their benefit. Basically, that is to continue on سكر ورزق الحسن. It's to hint to the, you know, the, the harm of uh, خمر, hinting to the harm of خمر. And then the next step after hinting to the harm of khamr or that khamr is not wholesome, the next step was to prohibit khamr at certain times, at certain times. That is basically gradual weaning. Ya ayyuha ladheena amanu la taqrabu salata wa antum sukara. Oh, you who believe do not approach the prayer while you are intoxicated until you know what you're saying. So certain times you're not, but after Aisha, you could drink, you know, if you have to, you could drink after Aisha, because by, by, by the time of Fajr, you should be fine. You should be able to uh, comprehend what you're saying. Now, but, but, but this would only limit their time of uh, intake very much. So that was the, the, the next step in weaning. We keep in mind that some of the Sahaba, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hinted that khamr, uh, you know, they quit drinking. Some of the Sahaba did not drink before the legislation. Al Abbas did not drink before the legislation, for instance, of the prohibition of khamr. Uh, and, and, but say, some of the Sahaba who drank before the legislation, they, they st ceased drinking at the first hint. And some, it took some of the Sahaba more and more until some of the Sahaba waited for the final decisive prohibition. That word, stay away from it, desist, refrain, is what uh, many of the Sahaba waited for. But when that was revealed, they were already prepared. The, 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 the wine flew, flew in the streets of Medina like rivers. Now, in order for us, you know, so that is graduation in Tashriya. And the next point is legislation for an occasion and for no occasion. Legislation for an occasion and, and for no occasion. Uh, but before we move on, on to this particular point, legislation for occasion and no occasion, the graduation of Tashriya, how do, you, how do you make use of this now? This already happened at, at one point in the, in the history of legislation. How do you make use of this now? Practically, how do you apply it? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, basically, you, you, you're not going to be able to, gra to, to gradually, uh, you, you're not going to be able to go back and say that we will uh, start with, you know, year one and then year two and year three. But you could always stay silent. You could always avoid, you know, overburdening the new Muslim, the newcomer, the w or the one who's making a U-turn, the one who's coming back, uh, who is oblivious to this, uh, you know, all of the Islamic teachings. Uh, I mean, if, if, if you overwhelm, if you, if you tell them, you know, don't walk into the masjid with your left foot on the first day, uh, and if you come down to the, 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 that level of detail on the first day, this is going to be overwhelming. So basically, you could, uh, you, could you, you, you should be selective. You should be careful. Uh, what is it that you want to tell them, and what is it that you do not want to tell them now?
So if someone basically uh, is uh, a musician, you don't need to volunteer the information on the first day. If he asks you, then you'll tell them what you believe. But you don't really need to volunteer because basically changing your religion is a momentous, is a huge, is an enormous step in your life. This is a life-changing decision. Uh, this is a moment of extreme uh, emotional changes. So, so you, like you, you're gonna tell him now on the, you know, uh, on the spot. And sometimes it will just happen, but if you, you do not want to tell them now on the spot that they should also change their career, particularly if this is their career or their livelihood. Uh, this is going to come at one point. So we will not be able to go back on the Sharia, to backtrack on the Sharia, but we could always control what we transmit to people and we choose the right time to transmit the information uh, to people. Yes. You, you, you tell her, uh, okay, well, sister, uh, you know, this is re uh, prohibited, but this is the better of the two. Uh, so do the better of the two. So you, 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 keep, uh, you keep her informed, you know, uh, so since the issue was raised, you will keep her informed, but you would guide her that in case you're not going to be able to do this, do that, which is still, I believe, prohibited. But at the same time, and I have to be honest with you, and it, it may be a little bit shocking to like a bunch of, you know, stricter conservative fellows here, uh, but it, it, uh, the issue of pants is an issue of controversy, by the way. Because, you know, you, you, you could bring this out from the books of fiqh. Uh, the, the Shafi'is do not require, the, the, they don't have one of the conditions of the soap to be fatfa, to be w wide enough so that it does not describe the details of the silhouette. We believe that this is a condition. We believe that the Prophet ﷺ said to Osama, why, have you not, why are you not wearing the garment that I gave you? So he gave a Qubtiyya, like a velvety uh, garment to Osama to wear. He did not wear it. He saw him. Why are you not wearing the Qubtiyya that I gave you, the velvety garment that I gave you? Osama said to him, because uh, I, gave it to, I gave it away to my wife. And he said to Osama, command her to wear uh, an undergarment underneath it so that it does not describe her bones. Basically, it does not describe the silhouette. Now, so we believe that the, 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 it should be wide enough to not describe the details. But the issue is controversial in the fiqh books. Uh, controversial uh, according to some of the followers of the Mazahib. Therefore, matters of controversy, particularly when you're addressing a new Muslim, when you're addressing a newcomer or a comer, like a comeback to Islam, the uh, matters of controversy should be uh, really featured very low on your list of priorities. So to change him from Shafi'i to Hanafi or from Han Hanafi to Hanbali, uh, I don't think this is a priority. This is crazy. You know, the, the guy is having difficulties with giving up zina. Or the guy is having difficulties with praying. Uh, so to, to change him now and to convince him now of the Hanbali or the Shafi'i or Ahl al-Hadith's position 
concerning one or issue or the other, it does sound to be quite, quite uh, imprudent. Yeah. So uh, whenever you know that th there is some controversy uh, concerning some issue, the issue of music itself is, is a controversial issue. It is important to know this so that you, it, not to, be, to compromise. It is important to know this so that you could be a guided die. Because I if we keep on breathing ourselves, like, like uh, sort of breathing uh, uh, extremism, like uh, sort of rigidity, uh, we will lose our effect as dais, and we will be talking to ourselves and we will not be able to reach out to the millions of Muslims that are misguided and the millions of others that need to uh, basically uh, get to know Islam. So uh, graduation here would mean that the controversial issues, they should be pushed to the back. We'll talk about the matters of consensus first, talk about the bigger issues first, talk about the aqidah matters first. This is what the Prophet did, you know. Now we're not going to change the deen, but it is basically the, uh, the arrangement of the order of what you communicate to them of the deen. The deen is already there, it's, it's done. But it, it is how you, are, you, you, you put in order uh, your message to them and prioritize what needs to be told first and what needs to be told last. At Tashriya al Munasaba li Ghayr Munasaba, which is legislation for an occasion and for no occasion, Mil Hikmat Nizul Quran Mufarraqan, and now can you allege your muskilat and let you take off Rahad and Nabawi, or you give all about the Asila and let you to Ajahu Ila Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The wisdom of the Qur'an being revealed in parts was to treat the problems that arose in the Prophet's era and to answer the questions directed to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So basically he's telling here, the Shaykh is telling here that some of, some of, the, uh, some of the legislations came in response to questions. And in the Qur'an you find this, yes, alunak al al al-Masr, yes, alunak al al-Mahid, uh, the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu oftentimes you find the man came and asked the Prophet Sallallahu you know, such and such question. So they, they ask you about Khamran and Maiser, they ask you about menstruation. You find uh, verses in the Qur'an, 13 of them, that mention that uh, the Sahaba triggering the uh, question. Uh, and then the answer came in response to the question. But that does not mean that the majority of rulings were in response to questions. Uh, because the majority of rulings were not in response to questions. So Salah was uh, made obligatory, not in response to question. Fasting was made obligatory, not in response to question. Zakah was made obligatory, not in response to question. So the major, major, uh, uh, you know, prohibitions were not in response, major uh, legislations or most of the major, most of the major legislations were not in response to uh, questions. So this is a tashriya li munasaba or li ghayri munasaba for a, an occasion or, no, or, or for no occasion, yes. يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تسألوا عن أشياء إن تبدأ لكم تسؤكم وأن تسألوا عنها حين ونزل القرآن وتبدأ لكم uh, you, oh you who believe do not ask about uh, matters that are if revealed to you they will uh, cause you hardship uh, and if you ask about them while the Quran is being revealed they will be revealed to you عف الله عنه والله غفور حليم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pardoned you or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, overlooked them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is غفور حليم so these issues, basically asking about the, 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 the small details, the small details of issues, or issues that do not uh, pertain uh, to uh, your practical, 
you know, pr your practice of the deen, or issues that uh, are trivial, or, or to ask the Prophet ﷺ to challenge him, because someone would come to the Prophet ﷺ and say, you know, my, I lost my camel. Tell me where it is. Uh, because he is a prophet. So, you know, and then someone would come to the Prophet ﷺ and uh, say, Man Abi? And who is my father? Uh, and and uh, actually, the, the, the occasion of the revelation of this verse. <clears throat> was mentioned to be this particular incident where a man came and asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then he insisted and then the Prophet told him and it was not his father it was not his known father so don't ask of things that if, become, if they become revealed to you they will cause you distress uh, so the, the different positions that the scholars had either the small details <clears throat> Either things that do not pertain to practice, like luxury, uh, such as the, the Safina at Nuh, like how many lugs were in the Ark of Noah, or how many, you know, how many animals and things of that nature, uh, such as, you know, challenging questions. But we know for sure that the Sahaba were prohibited from asking questions, period. Uh, you know, detailed questions. Again, detailed uh, questions. Because Anna said that نُهِينَا عَنِ السُؤَالِ فَكَانَ يُعْجِبُنَا أَنْ يَأْتِيَ الرَّجُلُ الْعَقْلِ مِنَ الْبَادِيَةِ فَيَسْأَ الرَّسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَنَحْنُ نَسْمَعْ We were prohibited from asking the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so we would like, we liked that a man, a rational man or a reasonable man, uh, a wise man comes from al from out, the outskirts of Medina, the Badia, the 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 desert, uh, and ask the Prophet ﷺ while we're listening. So it, this, this was like um, a message from the Prophet ﷺ that you should really learn to, to learn for practice. When we were talking about La Taghdab yesterday, hadith number 16 of Arba'in al Nawaya, La Taghdab, and he said, Awsini, and he said, La Taghdab, and he said, Awsini, and he said, La Taghdab. Don't get angry, don't get angry, don't get angry, you know. We said that this is to emphasize the importance of not getting angry, but there is another benefit in this. Because there is more wasiya than la taghdab. The Prophet ﷺ gave other wasiya than la taghdab. It's not like, you know, this is it. This is, you know, this is the only wasiya. This is it. Uh, because, uh, say, I believe in Allah, then be straight. You know, many wasaya that the Prophet ﷺ gave the companions. But here, la taghdab, la taghdab, la taghdab, is basically also to point out, it is to underscore the importance of la taghdab. But it is to point out that this is a lot of work. La taghdab is a lot of work. So don't be asking for more and work on this first. Because it takes a lot of work to la taghdab. It takes a lot of work to la so that you become, <clears throat> as we said yesterday, all of the work that we said yesterday, that it takes for one to, to, to really uh, live up to this wasayya. So don't be asking for more. Why are you asking for more and if you need to work on this one first? Now you will say then we should not be seeking all that knowledge because we're not acting upon half of it. <laughs> and the answer to this is, is that you should act on it. <laughs> you should act on it. Uh, basically there is, there, is, there is need for more da'is, there is need for more teachers. Uh, we're not in the Medina of the Prophet Sallallahu where, where there was abundance of uh, teachers and da'is. Uh, certainly during the life of the Prophet Sallallahu he was enough for all of them, but uh, even after the Prophet Sallallahu there was still abundance. Uh, 
And then he moved on to, so basically you read the rest of it, but, but this is just the gist of it. You know, some legislations were revealed in response to questions, some legislations were revealed not in response to uh, questions. And then the, the next one will be uh, the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, and its sciences. <coughs> And the definition of the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam etc. In its capacity as a source of legislation, it is defined as the statements, actions, and tacit approvals of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that's the definition of the Sunnah. Why did he say in its capacity? as a source of legislation. Yeah, because the sunnah, the, the, the definition of sunnah varies with the, 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 the basically, uh, yeah, your, your angle, your perspective. If you're a scholar of aqidah, sunnah to you is, is defined differently. If you're a scholar of usul al-fiqh, sunnah to you is defined uh, or this is the definition according to the Usulis. This is the definition of the Usulis. But if you are a Fiqih, you may define Sunnah differently. If you are a uh, Aqidah uh, scholar, you will uh, define uh, Sunnah differently. If you are a Muhaddith, you will define Sunnah differently. Because for the Muhaddith, their definition is the most comprehensive because they care about anything that has anything to do with the Prophet ﷺ, even his physical description. So the physical description of the Prophet ﷺ to the Muhaddis is part of their definition of Sunnah. So everything that is reported from the Prophet ﷺ or relating to the Prophet or pertaining to the Prophet, to them this is Sunnah for the Muhaddithin because that is, their, that is their focus. And for the Usulis, they deal with the Sunnah in its capacity as a source of legislation. So the Sunnah that is, that is a source of legislation is the actions you know, statements, actions, and tacit approvals of the Prophet ﷺ. For the fuqaha, they may use sunnah, which is a, like quite a, a, quite a troublesome uh, definition because it caused a lot of confusion, even though it did not confuse the fuqaha. Rahimahumullah wa hafiz al minhum. May Allah bestow mercy on them and preserve those who are alive. But it did not confuse them, but it confused the public. When they used the sunnah to refer to the mustahab acts to the recommended preferred uh, acts, then that caused a lot of confusion for the public uh, where, where they started to think that anything that comes from the Prophet ﷺ is not binding. Uh, show it to me in the Quran. You know, and like in Egypt. For Quran da? No. So that, that, and then Sunnah, according to the scholars of Aqidah, is, is, is basically the Aqidah of the Prophet, the, the, of the Prophet's approach to the Aqidah and Manhaj and, and so on. So the uh, Sunnah varies. Uh, the definition of Sunnah varies depending on your focus. Okay, so I think for the majority of you, or for almost all of you, this is this will be redundant if we talk about this in detail, right? So the the uh, statements, actions, and tacit approvals of the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as a source of legislation. So I will uh, move on to the next uh, point, which does not mean that you skip over it when you're reading. When you're reading a book, you don't skip over anything. Uh, particularly the introduction. You will have to read it bo cover to cover. You could be missing things in the introduction that will affect your understanding of the entire book. So you read the book from cover to cover. Unless you want to read one chapter or something. But if you embark on reading a book, don't skip over anything. There will be always benefits. You don't have you know, encompassing knowledge of any topic. Therefore, more reading will be confirm, confirmatory or uh, will add benefits to you. But th this is for the, for the interest of uh, 
you know, time uh, in, in the time of the class and so best usage of the class time. The status of the Sunnah in relation to the Quran. And the, he, the Sheikh here said uh, the, status of the status of the authentic Sunnah and authentic and confirmed Sunnah in relation to the Quran has many manifestations. Uh, basically, you, you, if you want to logically classify the Sunnah in relation to the Quran, now th those are two sources, <coughs> two sources of uh, legislation. So, if you want to logically come up with your own classification of the relationship between the Sunnah of the Quran, a logical classification, because logical classifications are easier to remember. So, the, the Sunnah is another. Uh, part of the revelation, another source of legislation. So it either uh, it either confirms what the Quran says, basically it repeats, reiterates, confirms, corroborates what the Quran says. That is the confirmatory sunnah. This is the confirmatory sunnah. It's called a sunnah al muakkida What did he call it here, Shaykh Rahimahullah? Taqreer, Sunnah al-Ahkam. So it is called the Sunnah al-Mu'akkida, confirmatory. It confirms, it corroborates, it reiterates what the Quran says. So, aqimu salah, sallu. You know, the, it just different wording uh, and uh, the same uh, meaning. So that is the confirmatory Sunnah. And all of the, you know, all of the legislations in the Quran uh, have been practiced by the Prophet ﷺ in his Sunnah al Fa'liyya, uh, and they have been also uh, reiterated by the Prophet ﷺ in his uh, speech. So that is Sunnah Taqririyya. Now, the second logical class, you know, uh, classification would be what? The independent one. So it, it, it either talks about something that the Qur'an mentions or does not, or talks about something that the Qur'an does not mention. So the independent one. And I think that the Shaykh here divided the independent one, which could create a little bit of confusion because the, the classification becomes a little bit less straightforward. He divided the sunnah that, that uh, the, the, uh, the sunnah, the independent one into two types, but he did not put them under one category. He just added the two types to the other two types. So he made it a four-pronged classification. The four-pronged classification according to the Sheikh here is, first, the Sunnah that confirms the rulings. Second, the Sunnah that introduces rulings that are inexplicitly referred to in the Book of Allah. Third, the Sunnah that brings independent rulings which are not found in the book of Allah. So second and the third, they belong to one category. They belong to one category. Because eventually, this second category, the Sunnah that introduces rulings that are, that are inexplicitly referred to in the book of Allah. That is a very like vague category. Let me tell you why. Because the examples on this category, for instance, when, Allah, when the Prophet Sallallahu forbids, uh, forbids uh, donkeys, the mystic donkeys, or when the Prophet Sallallahu forbids, uh, you know, other kinds of uh, animals with canine teeth, predatory animals with canine teeth. The, 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 the root of this in the Qur'an is what Allah is saying, and makes lawful for them the good things and prohibits for them the evil. But is so general that it wouldn't, like, you know, it would, it would very hard to be considered the root of the, of the, it would be hard to say that this is not independent sunnah. It looks to me like an independent sunnah. Because after all, does not only pertain to food. Every good action, the Prophet will, 
So you could say that, that there is no independent sunnah whatsoever. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Take whatever the Prophet has given you and abstain from that which he forbade you from. So if you say that this is the root of all of the independent sunnah, then you will say there is no independent sunnah. Therefore, the disagreement between the, uh, uh, the disagreement between scholars over the presence of independent sunnah is basically a technical uh, or morphological disagreement. It doesn't have anything to do with, it is the, one of the most meaningless disagreements because they do not amount to anything. Because there is none of the scholars who said that we will not take it if it is not in the Quran. There is none of the scholars who said that combining um, a woman and her aunt is permissible uh, because it is, not, it is independent. It is not in the Quran. Uh, none of the scholars said, you know, that there, the, there will be a share of uh, the will for the heirs or inheritors. Uh, so they all acted upon the independent sunnah. It is just about whether we should call it independent sunnah or not. And those who did not want to call it independent sunnah, they tried to find a basis for it in the Quran somehow regardless of how general that basis is. But we, we have a very general basis for all of the sunnah in the Quran, which is So if you want to call that this is, uh, this is good enough to, to make all the sunnah uh, having root in the Quran, say it. That's fine. That's fine. So, the, so the, sometimes when this disagreement takes place and the, you know, the public hear of this disagreement, or the beginners of the students of knowledge here, this, this agreement, they may think that the scholars actually disagree over the, the capacity of the sunnah to independently legislate. They never did this. There is no such disagreement, you know, about over the capacity of the sunnah to independently legislate. They disagree over whatever we have that is independent now. Should we, shall we call it independent or not? So all of them would say, so all of them will say that prohibiting combining as co-wives a woman and her aunt is part of the deed by agreement. Then they will come and disagree. Is this independent sunnah or not independent sunnah? So some of the scholars will say it's independent sunnah. We don't have any mention of this in the Quran. And some of the scholars will say, no, it is not independent sunnah. Because the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade combining between a woman and her sister in the Qur'an. And that is to hint that combining uh, between women as co-wives could result in the, you know, uh, ruining the relationships or cutting off the rahim and so on. Uh, therefore, the Prophet ﷺ extrapolated from this and it is not independent. But that becomes problematic also. Because you could say, <laughs> you know, that uh, the, the, the Prophet ﷺ forbade combining between a woman and her aunt, but he did not forbid combining between a woman and her cousin. And, you know, it's not like something that you extrapolate from. This is independent legislation from the Prophet ﷺ uh, that has no, you know, there is no mention of the Qur'an, of, you know, the prohibition of marrying a woman and uh, her aunt. And the fact that the Quran prohibited combining between a woman and her sister is not really sufficient to say that this prohibition, this prohibition in the Sunnah, is actually based in the Quran. Okay, so the issue here is we have a Sunnah that corroborates what's there in the Quran. We have a Sunnah that is, that independently legislates. And let us be honest. The sunnah that independently legislates is very rare, very rare instances where the sunnah independently legislated. So you could, you, could, you could just mention a few of them, you know, and some of them are arguable also, but you could mention a few of them, domesticated donkeys combining a woman and her, you know, aunt and uh, uh, as co-wives and 
and the, the la wasiyya ta liwarith there is no uh, uh, wasiyya for uh, the inheritors or the heirs very few instances where the sunnah independently legislated the bulk of sunnah is what so the sunnah that independently legislates is called the sunnah al-mustaqillah independent sunnah mustaqillah so we have the mu'akkida and mustaqillah or or al-mu'assisa another word that the scholars use for sunnah al-mustaqillah or the independent al-mu'assisa foundational it, it founds a new ruling and the bulk of the sunnah is what? as shariha which is the explanatory and that is the bulk of the sunnah so we have three major classifications we have al-mu'akkida the confirmatory corroborative you know uh, sunnah that is basically the sunnah that repeats, reiterates what the Qur'an says. And you have on the other side the independent. And you have in the middle the explanatory as shariha. Independent is mu'assisa, foundational. Foundational? Good enough? Really? Or mustaqilla, independent. Uh, and the bulk is in the middle. So this is so that you are familiar with the, the division of the sheikh. So the, follow this logical division, and then understand that the sheikh divided one category into two, al mustaqil basically, which is not explanatory and not confirmatory. The third type, which is al mustaqil he divided it into two. He said that one of them. Is the, has some basis in the Quran, inexplicitly mentioned in the Quran, inexplicitly mentioned in the Quran, and the other part has no, you know, there is no basis for it in the Quran at all. And there will be examples here, multitudes of examples here, that you could actually use but you know we don't need to give examples I gave you examples about al-mustaqilla because that's the only thing where you need examples the independent foundational combining between Oman and her aunt no, no share of the will for the inheritor you know the, the, the prohibition of domesticated uh, domesticated uh, donkeys uh, canine uh, Although that there is some some basis that could be made up for this. Uh, what, what about like the fiddle? Like you know, getting the nail, like beyond the head, grooming. Are those most of them? Is there independence? Most of them are. Now. The, the idea here is the scholars who say that there is no independent uh, will, will figure out something somewhere, you know. Uh, oh brother, don't don't hold me from my beard. Tells you that Sunnat al Anbiya is to grow beards and this is mentioned in the Quran and stuff like this. Uh, that this has a basis in the Quran because in the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wala amurannahum fala and I shall command them to change the creation of Allah. And that is changing the creation of Allah. So you will find something here or there uh, to basically link it up back to the Quran. And it's, it, it is fine. If, you know, as long as we're not rejecting, as you know, no scholars rejected the Sunnah because it's not in the Quran. You know, this is a, a, a confusion that the public may have. Uh, or some people, or some misguided people, or misguided sects may have. No scholars of mainstream Islam rejected the Sunnah because they, the, the, the established Sunnah, because it is not mentioned in the Quran. Uh, I think I will just stop here because the, the issue of the Prophet's Ijtihad would require, like, 
you, you to have fresh minds and uh, we can go over this next time inshallah it's the had rasul sallam the prophet it's the had or exercise of discretion subhanakallahu alhamdulillah